Hello everyone, this is Michael Moore here. Um, my apologies for interrupting your Saturday night. Um, i sure there are much better things to be doing right now than uh, listening to me on a Facebook Live. But I, um, I was going to wait and uh, do this uh, tomorrow. But the sense of urgency I have about what I think is going on right now and why I believe that Wednesday uh, was not the end of what we're going to be dealing with between now and Inauguration Day. In the last couple of days, there have been posters plastered all over Washington, D.C. and across many of our state capitals calling for an armed March, an armed march, a march where you come with your guns, a march on the Capitol in D.C. Um, and I, I don't really want to, I don't want to give it any attention in, the, in some sense. So I'm just going to say it's, it's scheduled for a day during Inauguration Week. And they're calling upon all patriots to um, march on the U.S. Capitol and on all 50 state capitals with guns and take back our country. Um, I was first shown this poster that they created. It's been now over two days. And um, it was given to me by, well, actually two members of Congress shared it with me as they're very frightened about what may be happening in the next week and a half. And we all discussed whether or not we should post it. Um, I posted it on my Instagram finally today and uh, Instagram uh, took it down. Uh, they don't want to promote this potentially violent march, and I don't blame them. But I think it's important that you, the public, know about it. Um, I've been watching the news here today. I don't see a whole lot of mention of it. They're certainly not showing the poster that's plastered all over the country and all over online. Um, but that's the that's the plan. And so I thought that I wanted to do two things tonight, and I'll try not to take too much time right here. One is to um, alert you to what I think is going to be happening. Um, and the second thing is I want to talk about how Wednesday happened so that we can learn from that, we'll learn quickly from that, so that perhaps we can avoid uh, some of what's being planned in the in the next um, uh, ten or eleven days. Now I'm not doing this because I, I don't want to scare you. <laughs> I've received a lot of mail from all of you this week and a lot of posts on on social media about how depressed and despondent and horrified you are. And of course. If we are stuck in that place, uh, it will be very hard to um, beat back these threats. Um, it doesn't have to end up like this, the way they want it to end up. And, and as I've often said, there's far more of us than there are of them, even though I realize 74 million votes for Trump are a lot of votes. Um, but that's, those 74 million are all, they're not all armed and they're not all going to D.C. or the state capitol to cause trouble. Um, but I do want to just take a quick look and give you my thoughts. And a lot of this is just my hunch. So I'm not saying these things, I'm not, this isn't a work of journalism. Although I have interviewed and spoken to online or on the phone with a number of people that we call leaders in this country, people who are in Congress, 
people who work on Capitol Hill. Um, ex-military, ex-cops, people that got out because they didn't want to participate in a system that simply wasn't right. So I've gotten a lot of insight and I've been told a lot of things and I want to uh, share them with you. And some of this is stuff you're not hearing on the mainstream media and, you know, but I'm, you know, they're, they're supposed to be giving you the news. I'm going to give you my hunch of what I think is going on and what happened on Wednesday. We all know who instigated the riot, the insurrection. His words were very clear there, down by the Washington Monument, with a massive crowd that had to have been 40 or 50,000 people who he asked to come to D.C. to fight these people on Capitol Hill who were going to give the election to the person who won the election. And um, it was an amazing crowd in terms of its size. And Trump and Giuliani and Don Jr. were vicious in their language about how this had to be stopped. Giuliani said this has to be a trial by battle. Don Jr. said, we're going to march up Pennsylvania Avenue and take care of all the zeros up there because there are no heroes. They're just zeros on Capitol Hill. And of course, Trump saying, now we're going to march up Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol building. And I'm going to march with you. This is just minutes before he went and got in his limousine and went back two blocks to the White House to hide out. He sends everybody out to do his dirty work. Uh, but, you know, if you've been in the military or if you've lived a life in this country, you know that um, the working people, the poor, um, are always the ones being used by those in power, those with money, to go do their dirty work. And so off the, the thousands were sent off, off and up up Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol building, fired up, fired up to have the insurrection that had been promised to them for weeks. Let me tell you something. I have filmed numerous times in the United States Capitol building and in the congressional offices for both the House and the Senate. I've done this for over 30 years. Um, I can tell you, first of all, it is impossible to get into these buildings. It is extremely difficult. Don't think I haven't tried to get my crew, my camera, everything in there. It is just virtually impossible. And um, so there are there is a system to follow. If you're bringing crew and equipment in, you have to, everything has to be gone through. And it isn't easy and it takes time. Um, and there are a ton of police there, Capitol Police. And last Wednesday, there's about 2,300 Capitol Police that exist on the Capitol Police Force. There were less than 500 who were called into work that day on a day when for weeks it was known that tens of thousands of angry people who said they were going to stop the vote count, the counting of the votes of the American people, the electoral votes, they were going to go to D.C. and stop it by any means necessary. That was their mission. And everybody knew it. So much to the extent that I have spoken to a number of members of Congress and their staff, and every single person that I've spoke to said that they, on Tuesday, the day before, told their staff not to come into work on Wednesday because they didn't feel it was going to be safe. And so much of the staff of many members of Congress were not there on Wednesday. They were home, home to protect themselves. So it was known, it was known by the members of Congress 
that this was going to be a potentially dangerous day. And when these members showed up to work early Wednesday morning, I can't tell you how many have commented to me or have commented to the media how bizarre it seemed that when they pulled into the to the parking lot there behind uh, the Capitol building or when they walked through the grounds to go into work, how few police were around. Knowing this was going to be such a huge protest day and yet it felt like, a, as one person told me, it felt like a Saturday on Capitol Hill. That's what it looked like. So right away, somebody made the decision to pull back and not have the proper amount of police there. Jim Clyburn, who's the third in command in the Democratic Party there in the House of Representatives, he said he pulled in and, and he said it looked bizarre. That's the word he used. It looked bizarre to him that that there just wasn't much of a presence there. So they all knew. They all knew. And they trusted that the Capitol Police somehow had a plan. They were going to be there to protect them. And everybody went into work and assumed nothing was going to happen until it did. Um, I want to tell you, too, that having worked in there and having filmed in there, it is so difficult to get your bearings straight, to know where you're at, to find anything. As I sit here right now, I cannot tell you where Nancy Pelosi's office is. As many times as I've been in there, I cannot give you directions right now to the Speaker of the House's office. There are so many tunnels underneath the Capitol building. They go out to five or six office buildings where the members of Congress and the senators have their personal offices. Uh, each of those buildings have five or six floors at least. Uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to find your way. And you know that if you've ever gone there to drop in to see your member of Congress. The one thing that is good about Capitol Hill is that if you are a citizen who wants to see your representative, you can do that. It's, it's, you, you go, you look at the, okay, it's in that building and it's that office number. And then you walk there and you walk, you go through the police, you go through the metal detector, you go through the, uh, the wanding, everything they do. And then you can go see your representative the way it should be in a democracy. It should not feel like a police state. It should feel like it's open to any of us to, to go in there. How did they find Nancy Pelosi's office? How did they find Jim Clyburn's secret office? He has a, he has, as the majority whip, he has an unmarked office. They didn't go to his real office that his name is on the door. They found his secret office that the majority whip uses. They found, they found places in there that even I, who have worked there for so many years as a filmmaker... I could not tell you where they're at. I didn't know Clyburn had a secret office. I mean, it's that, it's that hard. The, why I'm saying all this is, is that I, I, it's clear to me that this was a bit of an inside job, that Republicans who are either members of the House or Senate or their staff, some of them helped the leaders and the instigators of this mob. The mob knew right where to go. The mob did not walk in there. They didn't walk in there like a bunch of yahoos. Like, well, Jesus, first time I've been in here. Look at this. Look at all the marble. No. No. They knew right where to go. They knew the doors to find the floor of the chamber of the House and the Senate, how to get there. They knew the tunnels. They knew it all. And when there's an investigation of this and how it happened, we're going to find out the truth. And hopefully we'll find out who helped them. Because I'm telling you, this crowd, they could not have done it on their own. 
Now, I'm not saying they hadn't done their own reconnaissance in the weeks leading up to this. I'm sure they did. But take my word for it. No average citizen could do what they did and get to where they got as quickly as they got without some help, without knowing, and without having police and law enforcement turn their heads and look the other way or open the door for them. You've seen the footage. Or or there was the one with the New York Times. Um, one of them said, where's Chuck, where's Chuck Schumer's office? And, and the cop, the cop showed them the way. Over and over, you hear these stories down the last couple of days on how helpful law enforcement was. Once these people had broken in, were already committing felonies, were already violating the law, were already knocking over statues, busting doors, busting windows. Hey, could you tell me where Chuck Schumer's office is? Well, yes, I can. You just go down that hallway there, make a right, then a left, and it's door 362. Hmm. There were a lot of police that didn't aid and abet actual everyday Capitol Police who fought back, who tried to block some of these doors, who got caught in the doors, seeing the footage of the one young police officer bleeding. Um, they were violently trying to come into the floor of the House of the Senate. They wanted to grab the boxes with the electoral votes and destroy them. They wanted to stop our, you and me, our votes from being counted. As we prepare to inaugurate the next president of the United States, they wanted that not to happen. And afterwards, they're like, some who got out of there, they maced me, they maced me. Have you seen that woman? Yes, there were a lot of women there. A lot of, remember when I say men or women, we're talking about white people here. All right, let's just be honest. That's the only reason they got away with it. Had they been black or brown people, they never would have got two steps in the door. But there, there were a number of the white women, 55% of the white women who voted for Trump were there representing the majority of white women who wanted four more years of Donald Trump and then we're shocked that the police were trying to fight back and keep them from stealing the boxes with the electoral votes. But there were many cops that, and there are members of Congress, Congresswoman Jayapal, others have already said there was something wrong, something fishy going on here. They personally witnessed police helping the mob, helping the terrorists who've come into the building to destroy the election of 2020. As far as terrorist acts go, other than maybe taking a human life, is there any worse crime that a terrorist could do than to prohibit us from deciding who are going to be our elected representatives in our Congress and in the White House? Think about this too. You've seen the footage now or you were watching it that day. Not only were the police hardly there, you know, and you've seen these scenes in the movies where the mob pays off the cops, you know, to kind of disappear for an hour or so, turn their heads the other way. There were no barricades set up, even though 50,000 people were coming down Pennsylvania Avenue toward them. There were no police horses. I'm telling you, I've been to demonstrations there since Nixon's inauguration. I was there. And uh, there are horses. At every demonstration in D.C., there are police on horses. And they are aggressive with it to block you from going down this street or that street. There were no horses. 
Only 500 of the 2,300 police present. What is that? What is that? One, almost a little, little more, one-fifth? One-fifth? Four-fifths of the cops not showing up to work. Let's be very clear about this. Oh, watch any of the footage from those hours. Remember, it was hours. It was from 1 o'clock until the National Guard arrived after dark. That's how long those members and their staff and people had to hide in closets and safe rooms in holy shit terror for their lives. Nobody showed up. Up in the sky, not a single helicopter. No helicopters. Aren't there usually police helicopters always at a protest, at a demonstration? This was not a protest or a demonstration. This was a mob terrorist attack on our Capitol building. And they were there to cause harm and to kill if necessary. And they did. They killed a police officer. So they weren't just terrorists then. They were cop killers. These very people who we've listened to all year chant Blue Lives Matter. And what they ended up truly being with a mask ripped off their face, cop killing terrorist mob. How do I know some of these these terrorists were police or ex-police, military or ex-military? Well, we already know a number of them. They've been identified. In fact, the woman who was trying to break through the door of the speaker's uh, uh, door of the floor of the House of Representatives who was shot in the neck by the police and killed, she was an Air Force veteran. There were many veterans in this crowd proud veterans, ex-military who knew exactly what they were doing, the way that they were repelling off the walls, up the walls of the outside on the Capitol building. You saw that. Have you ever seen that? Dem demonstrators repelling on ropes that they brought with them all the equipment to do the repelling. And one of them, there's a great picture of one of these ex-cops who were part of the terrorist mob. He had a huge thing of zip tie, handcuffed zip ties on his belt. The con you can't get these at, at uh, the supermarket. You can't get these zip ties with your Ziploc bags. These were the real deal. They had police gear attached to the armor or the uniforms that they had on so that they could arrest, possibly kidnap. We know something about that in Michigan. Um, they had lead pipes. Some of them had pipe bombs. Some of them had other explosives. Uh, some of them carried semi-automatic weapons. And you wonder why you hear this defund the police thing. It's, 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 yes, obviously it's probably the wrong term because what we need to do is we need to have real law enforcement and real justice. And when we need protection, real protection. You know why people are angry at the police? Because on a day like that, when the police are not at work, maybe they're told to stay home. And then they allow a mob of thousands into the building. Are they calling for backup? Where's the backup? No backup's coming. Now, the mayor of D.C. tried to call the president and ask for him to send in the National Guard because D.C. is an estate, so she isn't the power of a governor. They're not real citizens if you live in D.C., a majority black city. So um, so she can't get Trump to send in the National Guard. 
right there, that alone, him not sending in the guard to protect the police and to protect the, the elected representatives who are there serving us and counting our votes. They're not in the middle of uh, discussing a farm bill. They're counting our goddamn votes as to who's going to be the next president and vice president of the United States. And this whole chaotic apparatus that took place on Wednesday was to stop that, and they succeeded for a number of hours. That alone is a crime that Trump didn't send in, that the mayor had to call the governor of Virginia and Maryland to beg them to send in their National Guard, which they did. Virginia did. I think Maryland sent in the some state police. <sighs> All the other things, think about this, that aren't right about this. Where's the press conference that we always see whenever there's an event, a big event like this, a horrible event, a school shooting, uh, something's happened in a shopping mall, uh, whatever. You have within an hour or two all the cops, the sheriff, the police chief, the mayor, the state representative, the everybody's at a micro at the big microphone, speaking to the press and answering questions as to what happened. The Nashville bombing, right? They, within hours, they're all there talking to the press. We haven't had that press conference yet. Do you realize that that none of them together have stood at a microphone? No Capitol Police chief who's now been fired. No D.C. police chief. No National Park Police. No FBI. No Secret Service. No CIA. No military police. Nobody has stood. And what are we in here now? Day four of this? Day four and no press conference. You know, the one we're used to when there's a school shooting or whatever and they all, they all get there and get their FaceTime in front of the microphone. Nobody in authority has stood there to tell us what was really going on. And the reason they're not doing that is because they know. By now, they know. They've done their own work. And they know who the rogue cops and the rogue military and the ex-military are and were part of this. And it's shameful for them they don't want to admit it. They want to get their story, a new story. They want to create a new narrative, and they're not ready to tell us what that narrative is yet. So that's why you've seen zero press conference. There's been one press call that some FBI guy was on, and press could call into that number and listen to what he had to say. That's it. You think that's a little strange? Do you understand why I think they don't want to talk to us? The public, they don't want to talk to the press because they got to get their friggin' story straight. That's why. I've been around this enough. I've been around all these bullshitters, these politicians, the police chiefs and the sheriffs and everybody, all political. It's all political. You know that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. They haven't, wouldn't even tell us who the dead are. Do you remember? And we went, what, how'd we go? Two or three days? They would, they would just say five were dead, and we knew one of them, sadly, was a police officer. But, that, but where were the rest of the names? Who else died? Remember they kept saying four died, then five died? Okay, who are they? Again, with any other incident like this around the country, we are told this within hours. It wasn't until Friday that they gave us some inkling that other than the police officer and the, the woman trying to break in to Nancy Pelosi's uh, area there on the floor, there were three others. And then on the third day, they finally gave their names, but they really would not say how they died. So I made a lot of calls here in the last 24 hours of people, you know, my contacts, Capitol Hill, whatever. And I've been told a number of things. Now, I don't know whether these are true or not, but more than one person told me more than one of these stories. So we'll know eventually. But it, it was, uh, you know, they said they died of medical emergencies. I've been told by, by two people that one of the men who died 
um, he brought a taser gun with him into uh, the Capitol to, I guess, tase the police or the members, whoever got in his way. And I guess he had it on his belt and maybe didn't know how to use it. And he ended up tasing himself. Tasing him, tasing him as I was told, tasing himself in his groin, which then sent him into cardiac arrest, and he died. I heard another person was climbing the tower that's been built for the cameras for the inauguration in a couple of weeks, fell off the tower and died. There was two men, and then there was another woman, and she was carrying a flag that said, uh, the, you know, the famous flag, don't tread on me. And she was crushed, essentially crushed to death. You've seen the shots of the mob pressing and pressing and pressing to get in the door. She was crushed to death and then trampled with her flag, don't tread on me, laying beside her. Okay, I know. Um, we get the irony. But I always think it's sad when anybody dies and I... You don't want to see that, and it's sad that they could have found a better way to protest peacefully. <clears throat> so there's the five we know about, as much as I know about it. And everything I just said could be completely wrong because I don't have any way to verify this. I don't have what the police have. I have what people who work on the Hill have told me. So take it, take what I just told you, with that degree of so now they've started to arrest some people. They hadn't arrested anybody that day. That day the most most of the arrests on Wednesday were for curfew violations because the mayor established the six PM curfew. <laughs> that was the majority of the arrests that particular day, all those people breaking into the Capitol building, causing the damage and destruction, putting people in fear for their lives, and they walked out at the end. You can see the footage. Just walk out. Ah, it's great to be white in America, isn't it? If any of them had been black or brown, there would have been a bullet in every one of their heads. You know it, I know it. And if you're black or brown, I didn't even have to say that because you've known it your entire lives. It must, it must look like a very bizarro movie if you're black or brown when you watched what happened on Wednesday, thinking how nobody of color would ever live through that experience. So they've arrested a few people that have, that look like the media stars of this event. The guy with his feet up on the desk of Nancy Pelosi. The guy with a Viking helmet. Um, the state representative from West Virginia. Um, they've arrested a few of these to make it look like they're doing something. And... Um, and go online and look at the charges that they've been charged with. Uh, trespassing. Forced entry. Uh, destruction of property. It goes down, it reads like that. I have yet to see one of them charged with committing an act of domestic terrorism. That's what this was. And yet none of them are being charged right now at least, with a terrorism charge. What if it had been 10,000 Muslims rushing that building and four days later <laughs> there's not a single terrorism charge? Well, I'm, I'm just telling you things that you already know and white people, I'm just reminding you of our privilege. And the privilege applies not just to being able to drive down the road and not get pulled over for no reason whatsoever. Our privilege doesn't just apply 
to walking through Home Depot and not having somebody follow us because you got you got to watch the white people when they're in the store, you know. No, not that privilege. Not the privilege of getting to go to a better school. Not the privilege of having just a, a bit of a leg ahead than the descendants of slaves. No, this is the privilege, as we saw it on Wednesday, of you can break into the most sacred building of American democracy and trash it, destroy things, steal things, and most importantly, have the members hiding under their desks, hiding in closets, thinking they could die at any minute. And it felt so good. And they got to walk out. And as we are speaking here on Facebook Live, they, they are still, to this day, they went home, those who went home, happy, happy as a lark. Nothing happened to them. They didn't feel like they had to cover their face. In fact, they had no COVID mask on because that's, that's who they are. It's amazing. Maybe I learned something I didn't know about one of the privileges of being white. I could literally smash up the United States Capitol. What else? The White House? What else could I do? And nothing would happen to me. Man, I mean, that's, that's a high bar. Nothing. No terrorism charges. Trespassing. Illegal entry. Stealing Nancy Pelosi's mail. Stealing Jim Clyburn's tablet. His iPad. It's gone. That's a felony. And then the, the, the footage later that night of some of these same protesters, they, sh they had a shot of them back at the Willard Hotel smoking cigars and having a good laugh. First of all, if you're not familiar with the Willard Hotel, it's maybe the most expensive hotel to stay in in D.C. It's right across from the White House, right across from Lafayette Park. It's right there on the corner of 16th Street where it dead ends at Lafayette Park, and there's the White House right there. And they're sitting there in the, I don't know what, if they have a cigar bar or a lounge or whatever, and they're smoking cigars and having a great laugh. Wow. Every single person who broke in to the Capitol building and caused any of that damage should be arrested. They need to arrest every single one of them. And most importantly, Trump has to be removed immediately. I, they're going to have. They're going to propose impeachment on uh, Monday. They're going to file the impeachment resolution and have a vote on it probably by midweek. That's too late. I hear tonight from the news that Trump now, encased in the White House, there, is upset that he was talked into going out and giving that one-minute video to tell the, the rioters and the mob to go home. They, we love you. You're special to us. That's what he said. But, okay, you've done your job for today. Go home. He regrets even doing that because he doesn't want to pull back from this one inch. He's not ashamed of anything. He's happy that the mob went and did his bidding. He incited a riot. He encouraged an insurgency and an uprising against the government of the United States of America. And for that, he has to go. And you're saying, well, how's the Senate going to? Well, read the rules. The, the next Senate, the Democratic one, can they can vote to convict him afterwards. Because the key here is that once he's convicted in the Senate, he can never run for federal office again. That's the rule. But the main reason the House has to impeach and the Senate has to deal with this now 
is that as one of our former national security directors said this week, he is our number one national security threat. We are in danger because of him and because of the mob that he rules. And anytime you have a situation like this, the head of it has to be taken off. The person who's responsible for this has to be stopped, has to be arrested, has to be imprisoned until there's a trial. And the people who enabled him, the 138 House members, Republicans, all of them, who voted after, after this awful riot was over, they came back in after midnight and voted to deny the people of Arizona and Pennsylvania the right to have their votes counted. 138 Republicans did that. It's an act of sedition. It's, a, it's an act of treason to prohibit the counting of the votes, the legitimate votes that every court, including the Supreme Court, including Trump's justices, said these votes are real, they're legitimate, and they must be counted. And yet tens of thousands and Trump and Don Jr. and Giuliani were all there to see that that didn't happen. And for a good eight hours, they succeeded. They succeeded in bringing the United States of America to a halt. That's exactly what they did. And they felt good. They felt real good. <sighs> so many white supremacists were part of this. And you understand how many white supremacists are also police officers. You know this. You've read the, all the data. White supremacists, right-wingers. They were all part of this. The ones that either that turned their heads or the ones who were there participating in the mob violence. The white supremacists who were wearing their, their T-shirts. One that had letters on it that said, stood for, six million is not enough. Referring to the six million Jews who died in the Holocaust. Another guy had a T-shirt on that said, I think it said, uh, Auschwitz summer camp. And there was a lot more of that. When they find out how many of these were police or ex-police or ex-military, the, the, the number of white supremacists that are in our military, the, the, the Pentagon knows they have a big problem with this and they've been trying to figure out how to deal with it. But these are white men, mostly, that are there to protect white privilege, white society, white culture, the white country that this was founded on. And I was watching Joe Biden on Friday announce the, the rest of his cabinet members. <clears throat> and before he did so, he said, I just would like to point out, because I promised you that my cabinet would look like America. 50% of the cabinet are men and 50% are women. Wow. That's never happened. And then he said this, and the majority are people of color. The majority of Joe Biden's cabinet is not white. This is the last thing these crazies need to hear. But Biden wouldn't back down. Biden made it clear he's coming after them. You will not break the law like this. You will not commit acts of treason in this country. There are consequences to your actions. And I pray to God that he follows through on this. I know what he said is true. The number one priority is stopping COVID and saving lives. Absolutely. And then we've got to get money in people's pockets, whether it's jobs or whether it's $2,000 a month or whatever it is, people are suffering right now and he's got to take care of that. 
and I'm sure he doesn't want the Congress having to deal with this. That's why they should just deal with it. It's a voice vote, my friends, in Congress. All those in favor of impeaching Donald Trump for encouraging an act of insurrection, say aye, aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. I want a roll call. Okay, good. I do too. I want their names on this. And then the Senate, McConnell, if you stand for anything, you need to let this go through. There needs to be a trial. A trial a, a trial needs to last a day or two. That's it. We all saw it. The evidence was there on display. We all were not on the Ukraine call that led to his impeachment, his first impeachment. But we all saw this. We all saw our president trying to take our country down. And that, to the vast, vast majority of us, is unacceptable. Don't wimp out on this, President Biden. Don't wimp out on this, Vice President Harris. If, if, if there are not consequences to these actions, this will happen again and again and again. And there'll be four years of the Biden administration where he's having to fight numerous acts of domestic terrorism and people will die because we didn't stop it at first. As I said to Representative Kildee on my podcast yesterday, you know, we're both Michiganders. We should have done something when those Michigan militia took over our state capitol back in the spring. Remember that? With long guns. And then at Christmas time, they showed up at the house of our Secretary of State and her. she was there with her small children decorating for Christmas. And they're all out there on her lawn and sidewalk with these semi-automatic weapons threatening her. Not one of them arrested. Not one of them who took over the Capitol arrested. And I said to Dan, I said, I think we're responsible in part for this because we were the dry run in Michigan back in the spring. And nothing happened. The ones who will do harm to us need to see that those who did this this week, they have to be punished to such an extent that everybody with half a brain will think twice before doing this again. The Democrats cannot wimp out on this. Tonight, Jake Tapper, Jake Tapper from CNN posted a tweet and he said, he wanted to sum up, like this says it all. He says, the big tell here in DC tonight is that as flags are flying at half mast all across the city and at the Capitol building because of the police officer who was shot and because of our democracy that was attacked. So the flags are all at half mast. He said the big tell tonight is that there's one flag that is not flying at half mast. And that is the flag on top of Trump's White House. He won't even lower the flag to honor the deceased police officer because, because he incited it he is a cop killer. That's how the law looks at it. You participate, you set it up, you don't have to be the one to pull the trigger or to commit the actual act that kills the cop. You set everybody up to go do this violence that killed the police officer. That makes you, Trump, a cop killer. Stop it with your Blue Lives Matter bullshit. You don't believe it. You've never believed it. Because you'd have to believe in law. And you've avoided the law. Every crime you've committed in your lifetime, you've gotten away with it. You've never spent a night in jail, which is just stunning to me. You can't even lower that flag halfway down to honor the dead, to honor our democracy. It's okay, I get it. In closing here, I, I just, I want to read you 
what I wrote and posted today in case um, you didn't get a chance to see it. And um, Facebook still has the um, the poster up that's all around town in D.C. and it is in many state capitals across the country calling for the armed march. So let me just read this to you and then we'll be done for the night. Thanks for staying with me. I know it's late. Um, I had to do it tonight. I love my country. Most of all, I love the people in it. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, I suggested to one of my nuns that, uh, that maybe we, we could write a better Pledge of Allegiance. And she said, well, what would it, what would it sound like? And I said, um, I pledge allegiance to the people. Oh, the people. Oh, well, yeah, the flag is, I mean, it's a symbol. I get it. It's a piece of cloth. I pledge allegiance to the people of the United States of America and to this republic for which we all stand. One nation, part of one world with liberty and justice for all. I was a precarious sixth grader. These are my, this is what I wrote, and then we're done. Friends, the terrorist attack is not over. Thousands from Wednesday's terrorist mob assault on the Capitol have not been arrested and have not left Washington, D.C. They are planning more attacks. This poster that I've included here on my Facebook site. It's being displayed all over. It's even been circulated among the members of Congress. It calls for an armed march three days before the inauguration and not just in DC, but in our 50 state capitals. Some leaders, whether they're politicians or in the media, they're afraid to say straight up to all of you exactly what I've been telling you here tonight. They're afraid, and I get it. They don't want you to panic. They don't want to help publicize these crazies in their next march or whatever they're going to do. And that's understandable. I get that. But the public... You needs to be told, and you need to be told now. And that's why I wanted to do this tonight. Law enforcement knows that there's more violence ahead. They know it right now. Trump and his inner circle, his crime family, have called for this uprising, and they are pleased with what they've seen, and they know what's going on. Unless these white terrorists are arrested now, en masse, there will be people killed between now and election, I'm sorry, between now and Inauguration Day. I can't stress this enough. Way too many police are sympathetic to their white terrorist brethren. They will stand down again, just like they did on Wednesday, and allow the violence to continue. I keep hoping in the back of my mind that this isn't really going to happen. I pray it isn't going to happen. But we have to treat this seriously. They've already issued the threat, just like they did for the weeks leading up to Wednesday. We have to treat it seriously and demand action. The terrorists saw on Wednesday that they could get away with this. They are empowered and they are excited. They believe that this is their moment. My friends, we are all in danger. 
I ask that you listen to me, please. Me, me, the person who warned you that Trump would win in 2016. The person who warned you that there would be no weapons of mass destruction found in Iraq and that the premise for the invasion was a lie. I'm the guy that warned you that Columbine would be only the first of many, many mass school shootings. And on and on. I only recite this litany of my failures. My failures to convince the public that we are in serious danger in the hopes that you will listen to me today. Impeachment is scheduled to happen before Thursday, is what they're saying. That's too late. It's too late. We must remove the head of the terrorist action today. He's at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. His co-conspirators are in the Republican caucus of the House and the Senate. And their mob, they're everywhere. They often wear red hats and have no COVID masks on their face. Some carry weapons. Some make bombs. A few kill cops. All of them know they are protected by their white skin and believe nothing will happen to them. All of them want to stop our votes from being counted. And they want to stop the new president from taking his oath of office. Here's their only problem. There's more of us than there are of them. And they know it. And it infuriates them even more. A strong show of legal force and the removal of their leader is the only thing that will stop what we are about to experience. And I don't mean just experience it in the next week or 10 days. We are going to have to live with this throughout the Biden administration, and I refuse to live with it. For the sake of peace, I ask you to join me in demanding action. We must stop this madness. There is no other alternative. Make your voice heard. Let your representatives know. Demand the arrest and prosecution of everyone who did this. And let's do our best to try to remove Donald J. Trump from the office of President of the United States. Don't fall for this. Come on, Mike, it's just a few more days. We can get through a few more days. We saw on Wednesday that it only took one day to see how precarious and how fragile our democracy is. We have a job to do. I will do mine. You do yours. We'll do it together. We'll get through this. And let's make everything I just said here during this Facebook Live not happen. Wouldn't that be great if two weeks from now, you guys just all wrote me and said, dude, you said all that awful stuff was going to happen. It didn't happen. Well, it didn't happen because you and I got busy, made our voices heard, and insisted that the people responsible for this act of terrorism were dealt with. And because we did that, we protected ourselves. But it's, uh, it's on us. Because too many of the so-called people in charge, too many of the people in law enforcement, too many rogue members of our great and wonderful military have, are off the reservation and they are looking forward to these next 10 days. Don't give up. Easy for me to say <laughs> after all that. But what else are we going to do? God bless all of you. 
have a have a great rest of your Saturday night. Um, I'm gonna go um, do a virtual movie watch with a, a friend or two. Um, I don't know who's watching. We try to do this on Saturday nights. Have a little virtual movie watch. Uh, Got to keep our spirits up. Um, so please don't sink into your despair. Act as a member of a great democracy. Um, I'll talk to you soon here in the next few days. I'll stay on top of everything that's going on, and I'll let you know what I know uh, so that you're not in the dark about a lot of this stuff. Uh, be well, and uh, thanks for letting me talk to you tonight. Take care.